All right, so it is Wednesday. It is almost 10.30. I just want to review again um, some information on where we are in the class and what's going on. So we are starting respiratory chapter, so chapter 23 from your book. And um, the anatomy portion, if you look at the original slides posted, uh, these new slides that I'm going to go over today are just going to be over the physiology. So the anatomy portion is what you need to focus on in lab. OK? And the lab handout should help guide you to make sure you understand what uh, models you need to apply that terminology to and what pictures might be used. All right, so today is the 14th. We have this lecture, and then your test is coming up on the 29th. Um, next week, I will try to do one more session over the respiratory system to ensure that um, we cover all the physiology associated with this system. All right? Now, for those of you that haven't seen the Everest movie, you can still use the um, Everest movie extra points for your next lab exam, OK? So just be aware for, of that. All right, uh, so chapter 23. Your next test in class is going to be in lab on October 29th, all right? And, um, Again, I will do a blackboard over chapter 23 um, next Wednesday. So our goal is to try to get through maybe ventilation today, how we breathe, respiratory rate, and some of the gas laws that influence that. And then we'll go through the specifics of how the blood's carrying um, everything for uh, the second part, and then some of our diseases and pulmonary function testing, OK? So hopefully, uh, I'll just give it another minute to see if anybody else shows up um, before we get going on our um, on our lecture here. Okay. Uh, if you need to listen to someone go through the anatomy, because I'm not going to probably have time to lecture on that, the anatomy GMC video with the lady, she goes, she uses the orange book, and she goes through chapter 23, and she does a pretty decent job of going through the anatomy, going through all the little parts of the nose and the nasal passageway and the pharynx and the larynx, and then your bronchioles and alveoli. So I highly suggest you take some time and listen to her lecture. And, and you could probably listen to the first half hour, because it's like a 75-minute a lecture. Um, and probably go through, I think, if I recall, the first half hour is really good on the anatomy. And then she does her spiel over the physiology, OK? OK, so let's move on to functions of the respiratory system. All right, so functionally, the respiratory system is here to provide a large surface area for air-blood interchange. Um, if I remember from my back in the day, it, I think the analogy is if you take all the alveoli and all the surface area of air capillary exchange, you're looking at like a tennis court worth of surface area, OK? So to get to air to this surface area, we have to be able to move air through the lungs, through the respiratory passages, and keep giving new air from the atmosphere into the system. So breathing is a function of the respiratory system, moving that air down towards the lower regions. While we're bringing in foreign material, we need to protect our respiratory surfaces from damage from pathogen invasion. So there is going to be the uh, barrier immunology component of the respiratory system. And so our mucous membranes, our, uh, our epithelial layers with cilia, and eventually our simple squamous epithelium that's down all the way to the, to the alveoli are all there to protect foreign objects from potentially getting into the bloodstream and damaging our respiratory uh, organs and our respiratory pathogens. Passes passageways, OK? And protecting is also key, because if we prevent damage, we 
we then decrease the loss of surface area. So with some of our like asbestos breathing in or damage with certain chemicals and gas, they are losing lung tissue. And with the loss of lung tissue, they're now going from a full tennis court worth of surface area to half a tennis court or a third of a tennis court. And that's going to have consequences with oxygen getting into the system because the surface area available for oxygen exchange is a problem. We also use the movement of air in our respiratory system to produce different sounds and other forms of communication. And we use our respiratory system to detect odors, which is going to play a huge role in how we taste and enjoy our food, so the special sense of smell, right? It's not listed in the book, so it wasn't, I didn't type it up here, but another big function of the respiratory system goes hand in hand with the urinary system to manage acid-base balance. The respiratory system has the ability to rid our body of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide gas wants when it's in water to combine with water and form a molecule known as carbonic acid. Carbonic acid because it's an acid when it's in water, wants to actually disassociate into a uh, hydrogen ion, which is part of the reason why it's considered an acid. It's donating hydrogen ions to a solution, and then the bicarbonate part. So carbon dioxide is a way for us to rid our body of carbonic acid molecules. And by ridding our body of carbonic acid molecules, we take away a molecule that's donating hydrogens to our water and making us more acidic. And the respiratory system with the urinary system is a way we try to help keep down our hydrogen ion concentrations. So respiratory function can influence pH levels of our bodies. All right, for the anatomy, there is a part of the anatomy where you just anatomically, structurally say, here is the upper respiratory tract, here is the lower respiratory tract. And usually the larynx is the division. So everything from the below the larynx is the lower, everything above the larynx is the upper respiratory tract. And depending on the, um, the book, sometimes the larynx is considered part of the upper, sometimes it's considered part of the lower respiratory tract, right? Functionally, where does oxygen diffuse into blood is going to be where we functionally say where is respiratory or diffusion occurring, so that's our respiratory zone. Everything above that's not allowing gas flow, gas diffusion, would be part of your conduction zone. It's part of a network of pipes to get oxygen, the ability to the tissues to flow in or out. So all of our organs of the respiratory tract include the nose, which is the external, you know, protrusion on your face. The nasal cavity, which is going to have your meatuses, um, where the concha bones form these kind of speed bumps. You're going to have a superior, inferior, anterior, and posterior ba uh, landmark. Then the nasal cavity is going to lead into the pharynx. And because the bones and because some of the air will tie into the bones in the face to keep them light, the sinuses will come into play. All right, the pharynx is going to be combo of the digestive and the respiratory tract. So this is where the two systems merge. But air flowing in is just going to pass through. And then at the end of the pharynx, we have two separate tubes again, the esophagus for the digestive, the larynx for the um, respiratory. And there's a cover of elastic connective tissue known as the epiglottis of the larynx that's going to direct um, air when it's open into the trachea and the deeper regions of the respiratory tract. And when it's closed, it's going to make food and whatever is going into the esophagus. All right, the larynx is going to contain, control, contain your vocal uh, organs, so the vocal folds, the vestibular folds that are going to play a huge role in voice and singing and communication. And then the trachea is going to be a tube with the esophagus traveling uh, through some of the upper areas of the thoracic cage. The trachea has cartilage, whereas the esophagus does not. The esophagus is muscle and tissue, connective tissue and epithelial tissue. The trachea is going to have cartilage that help prevent the trachea as a tube from ever fully collapsing and the epithelial mucus part of the trachea ever touching and then sticking and causing problems to reopen that tube. 
Uh, the lungs are going to be containing when the trachea divide into your bronchioli, bronchioles, and eventually your alveoli. So the lungs are the external feature. And then when you get into the tubing network, you have bronchi, bronchioles, and eventually your alveoli, your air sacs. Okay? Now, in the alveoli, um, they are not all the same size. And so physics-wise, they are where water and fluid uh, kind of are ha in that air, and that is going to create surface tension and the want of those alveoli to collapse, okay, or those alveoli to expand out. So you have a problem with um, dynamics of keeping these different sized um, air cavities open, and that's going to be something we're going to talk about with a challenge of the respiratory network, um, keeping all these different shaped sacs open and not having them overly collapse or overly expand, okay? And then interacting with our bloodstream at the capillary level, okay? The pleural cavities are another anatomical feature surrounding each lung. The pleural cavities are from chapter one, you learned about the visceral pleural membrane and the parietal pleural membrane. They are serous membranes, so they are composed of a simple squamous epithelium called a mesothelium that creates a little bit of a fluid, a transduate, a serious fluid that enters and hangs out in the cavity in the space between these two membranes. Behind this mesothelium, the simple squamous epithelium, like all epithelial tissues, is going to be a connective tissue. And that connective tissue is going to have collagen, elastin, areolar material, maybe some adipocytes, some fibroblasts, and some water, some macrophages, some different immune, uh, immune cells. And is going to sit and then connect the serous membrane to the, for the parietal, to the bones, the muscles of the thoracic cage. And for the visceral membrane, going to connect to the lung tissue proper, the capsule part of the lung that um, then encases and encapsulates all those alveoli, all those bronchioles, all those um, passageways and blood vessels. All right. So, the pleural space, the cavity, is the little bit of space with serous fluid, the transduate, between the two mesothelial layers. So it's a moist, slippery area. And because there's water and because the space, um, the parietal pleura wants to pull out with the thoracic cage and the visceral wants to pull in with the lungs, we have a little bit of a, a force where the parietal membrane's pulling away, the visceral membrane's pulling away, there's fluid in there, and so it creates a negative pressure. So it's slightly negative uh, based upon what is the atmosphere and what is the pressure usually inside the lungs, the intrapulmonary pressure and the interalveolar pressure. And that negative pressure is important because it is what helps keep our lungs somewhat being pulled open with that force towards the pleural cavity. And it's what keeps our rib cage and our thoracic cage from bowing out because it helps kind of pulls it down. So it's important we have a negative kind of pressure between these two membranes that's less than what it should be in the inside of the lungs and less what it is in the atmosphere because it's what keeps the lungs inflated and what keeps our chest from, you know, expanding to its maximal point outward. And it gives us the ability to be able to expand the chest outward or to press the lungs in or expand the lungs out and therefore it's going to play a role in allowing us to ventilate and basically change pressures inside the lungs versus outside the environment and vice versa so we can then move air by a pressure gradient. Okay. So when we look at the respiratory system, we normally look at four phases. How do we get air to flow into the lungs? That is the ventilation side. And that is going to be a role of making pressure changes between pressure in the lungs versus pressure outside the body to change so that we create gradients for air to move from high pressure to low pressure. The second part of respiration is transporting gases to the cells. And that is therefore going to play a role of the cardiovascular system in the blood. And this is where we're going to focus on how do we carry oxygen in the blood. And we carry it two ways. We carry it diffused as a gas in solution so it's diffused in the blood. And then the other way is we carry it in a bound chemical reaction form inside red blood cells attached to a protein hemoglobin. All right. 
So oxygen is carried two ways. Carbon dioxide is actually carried three ways. There's a part of carbon dioxide that will diffuse, like other gases, like oxygen, into our blood water, into the plasma of the blood. And then the other ways we carry carbon dioxide are by changing it and binding it or changing it into a new molecule. So carbon dioxide will bind to some of oxygen's binding sites on hemoglobin. So we will bind carbon dioxide, a small percentage of it this way, uh, to the hemoglobin molecule. The majority of carbon dioxide, though, is going to in the red blood cell, because it's a gas, so we can diffuse into the red blood cell membrane, in the presence of an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase, that is going to facilitate carbon and water molecules, carbon dioxide and water molecules, combining to form a new molecule known as carbonic acid. As an acid, molecules are going to, uh, these molecules, when in water, donate hydrogen ions. So what happens is you're forming, because you have a high amount of carbon dioxide and a high amount of water molecules, you form more carbonic acid, and carbonic acid then readily disassociates in its acid form to a hydrogen ion and a bicarb molecule. All right, so this is how carbon dioxide gets called an acid of our body, even though technically carbon dioxide as its molecular structure, CO, doesn't have a hydrogen ion to donate. It's because it binds to water that we end up having hydrogen ions available to donate to the solution and increase the hydrogen ion concentration. Now, the hydrogen ion concentration will stay in the cells, and some of that will diffuse out into the plasma. The bicarbonate part, the, the negative part of the molecule, will actually leave the cell. But in order to leave the cell, because it's a negative molecule, it has to be exchanged for another negative molecule. And this is where chloride becomes important. All right? And so that's where you see what's known as the chloride shift. The ability of bicarbonate to leave the inside of the red blood cell is because a chloride molecule comes in, and a negative molecule is then exchanged, and the bicarbonate negative molecule can leave and enter into the bloodstream, the plasma, um, outside the red blood cell. Okay. Now, eventually our goal in the respiratory system is to get oxygen to our tissues so oxygen can be bound um, with water into, uh, or formed into water by becoming the final electron acceptor at our, um, at our mitochondria while, while we make energy. Oxygen is also used in other chemical processes, okay? And then in the process of making energy, we're breaking glucose or breaking fat. We're breaking and liberating carbon molecules, and carbon binds with oxygen and becomes carbon dioxide. And so that's a way we make more carbon dioxide waste products that we then have to get rid of because of the acid nature of it. So ventilation, diffusion, transport, diffusion, and then utilization in the tissues. The diffusion is known at the long level as external respiration because we're moving oxygen from the outside of the body into the body. The diffusion from the red blood cells to the cells to be able to then do cellular respiration, so processes of making energy, is known as internal diffusion. Okay? So our, we'll get more into pulmonary ventilation, but let's start with external respiration, again, is the movement of oxygen into the body from the external environment, and in many cases, it's carbon dioxide moving from our blood out to the outside environment, right? External respiration means we need to have good ventilation, we need to have good airflow coming into the body, so we need to have a breathing rate that allows us to move a sufficient amount of air into the body to allow for oxygen sufficient amounts to come into the system and carbon dioxide to go out of the system. Okay. We need an environment where the gas diffusion allows for fast gas exchange with a very small distance to cover and a large surface area. All right. So we need a place where alveolar capillaries, alveolar airspace are interacting with very little distance to cross. So we don't want a lot of mucus in our lungs. We don't want a very robust cell um, present. And we don't want a very robust connective tissue present. We also need to have a large surface area so we have a lot of oxygen interacting with the blood. So the time that the blood is in the lungs, which is very short, is 
even though it's a short period of time, is still sufficient to unload sufficient amount of oxygen to deliver later on to the cells to meet their oxygen demands and their ATP making demands. Okay. And within the, the blood, we need enough capillaries with enough red blood cells to sufficiently grab and transport that oxygen because most of the oxygen is bound in the red blood cells uh, to hemoglobin. Okay. The internal respiratory pathways are a reverse of what's going on externally. We need to be able to then very quickly have a large surface area of capillary cells interacting so the cells can grab the oxygen from the bound hemoglobin from the diffused, um, dissolved state, pull it into their cells and rebind it into new molecules that can then be hoarding the oxygen inside the cell. All right, we need large surface area, we need small diffusion space, so we need the capillaries and the cells to have a small uh, barrier to overcome. And we need a high kind of concentration gradient maintained so we promote oxygen going into the tissues and carbon dioxide coming out of the tissues. Anytime the oxygen is not being sufficiently supplied to the body, that's a state of hypoxia. So hypoxia happens when people don't have enough lung. Um, maybe they have a collapsed lung or they have disease and they don't have enough surface area and so they're not getting enough oxygen into their bloodstream that's sufficient to meet the demands of their body. You also get hypoxic when you start going up in altitude and at certain altitudes the oxygen available in the atmosphere is not sufficient to adequately bind to all of your red blood cells, to all of your hemoglobin to then bring enough oxygen to our bloodstream. Uh, to our tissues to meet the demands of the cells. Now, anoxia, because the A is there, means without oxygen. So this is space. There is not enough oxygen to provide any oxygen really at the tissue level for our bodies. Anoxia would be if you inappropriately hook up somebody to the carbon dioxide scrubber of a machine and so now they're breathing zero oxygen in. So anoxia would be without oxygen. Hypoxia means insufficient oxygen, okay? All right, pulmonary ventilation as well as our external internal respirations, in some ways it comes down to some of these physical laws that we have of how gases interact in air, water, air, liquid solutions and how they combine to form pressure. Um, total pressure and then their partial pressures, their components of a total pressure. So we have four gas laws we need to talk about. Boyle's law we've talked about in the inner ear. It is a relationship that pressure and volume are inversely related. We talked about it in the heart with isovolumetric contra uh, contraction and isovolumetric relaxation. In our hearts, if you recall, when we enter systole, the semilunar valves and the atrial ventricle valves are closed. And we have a volume of fluid that is in the lungs that is our end diastolic volume. And we have a pressure in that lungs or in that heart that represents the fluid, the end diastolic volume pushing on the chamber and the chamber being a certain size. When we start systole, remember the volume, the chamber size is going to shrink and the volume of fluid in that chamber is not changing because the valves are not opening. And so what we saw was as the volume of the chamber got smaller, the fluid in that chamber started to generate more pressure on the walls of the heart and we saw pressure increase. And once the pressure increased to a certain amount, we saw the valves, the semilunar valves open. All right. In the ear, we saw this as if we go up in altitude, the pressure in the atmosphere is decreasing, so the inner ear pressure had to equalize. It was higher in the ear than it was outside, and we click and we wiggle our jaw and we equalize. When we came down from altitude, as the pressure in the atmosphere got larger and the inner ear had a lower pressure, if the eustachian tube is blocked or it's really tiny and it's the membrane in that eustachian tube is sticking or it's clogged with mucus, that inner ear, that middle ear area started to become low pressure and started to become a vacuum and it would start to pull on our tympanic membrane. And if we don't force 
the eustachian tube to clear the pressure gradient and the difference between outside versus middle ear, we would blow our tympanic membrane. And that's not pain, that's very painful. Okay? So how does this work with the lungs? The thoracic cage is an entity, think of it as a balloon. And like a balloon in the air, if I am going to make the pressure around the balloon change, the volume of the balloon is going to change inversely to that. All right? So if with contraction of my inspiratory muscles, I pull my thoracic cage down a little bit into my di with, with my diaphragm into my abdominal cavity. With my intercostals, with maybe accessory muscles, I pull my rib cage outward. I am actually making my thoracic cavity bigger. The volume increases. Because the volume increased, the pressure will change opposite. It's inverse. So the pressure in that thoracic cavity is going to drop a few millimeters in pressure. Because I see a pressure change that's now less in the thoracic cage versus what is in the atmosphere, I now create a, an environment where I have high pressure outside, low pressure inside the lungs, and air will flow in until the pressures equalize. Right? All right, our second law is Charles's law, and this is that temperature is inversely related to volume. Now, we see this with um, a little bit of changes with the environment temperature. So as temperature decreases, so as it gets colder, our atmosphere actually collapses in. It gets smaller. So what would, that would mean would be maybe instead of half an atmosphere being 18,000 feet, half an atmosphere is maybe 16,000 feet. And maybe the atmosphere um, that we could live you know, and breathe upon and still have oxygen in the atmosphere instead of being like 30,000 feet would probably be 28,000 feet, okay? So the cold makes our volume decrease. Conversely, if it gets warm, our volume of gas increases. And so when we look at the poles versus the equator, we actually see that our atmosphere is larger at the equator than it is at the poles. So that means half an atmosphere might be 20,000 feet if you go into the warmest part of the Earth at the equator than what it would be at the poles. Okay. So not usually a big deal because we're mostly sitting at sea level unless we're in extreme temperatures. And we usually say temperature is holding for a standard atmosphere, holding constant. But it can be a factor if we are looking at patients and we're looking at them being hypothermic or um, in heat stroke or heat issues. Okay. All right. Dalton's law is going to be that our total pressure is made up of the partial pressure of the gases of that atmosphere. All right? So in our atmosphere, we see that nitrogen is the biggest gas component. In our atmosphere, our total pressure, which is usually written as 29.92 inches if you're looking at airplanes, or our standard atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury, meaning that the atmosphere weighs, if you weigh it as a stack of books or a stack of mattresses, it's going to weigh, push on mercury, and make it push up into a glass tube to a height of 760 millimeters high. Okay? And that mercury being pushed to that height is a combination of how much does the nitrogen in the atmosphere weigh? So the partial pressure of nitrogen. How much is the oxygen in the atmosphere weigh? So the partial pressure of oxygen. And then how much of all the other gases combined weigh? And guess what? For our air and our Earth, nitrogen is 78% of our atmosphere. So 70% of what is total pressure, atmospheric pressure, is because of what does nitrogen weigh. About 20% is oxygen. So what our um, atmosphere weighs is 20%, 21% oxygen. And then all the other gases work out to be about 1%. So carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, helium, argon, freon, xeon, whatever is a gas. Okay? Now, when we look at the, at the air we're breathing, it's going to change as it comes into the body. So Dalton's law is going to add a few other factors to what is going to make the total pressure. 
The first thing we do is we humidify air. And you see this when you have cold. When you exhale, sometimes it makes a little frost or a fog because you are breathing out water. So when we look at air in our mouth, in our lungs, we have to add in that there is humidity in there. And so our total pressure is now going to be what is the partial pressure of nitrogen, what is the partial pressure of oxygen, what is the partial pressure of water, the humidity, and what is the partial pressure of other components. And then when we look all the way down at the alveoli, we had dead air space. We had residual volumes of air that never left the lungs despite our best efforts to breathe it out. And in that air, there's a component of the carbon dioxide that's diffused out of our bloodstream. And so when we look at alveolar air, Dalton's little equation is going to change again to be what is the pressure of the nitrogen, the pressure of the oxygen, the pressure of the water, the pressure of the carbon dioxide, and then the pressure of all the other gases. And what that ends up doing is the total pressure stays the same. It's always 760, 760, 760. So what we see is as we add higher contributions from water, higher contributions from carbon dioxide, we are going to take away the contributions of nitrogen and the contribution of oxygen. And in doing so, what we see is under standard sea level conditions, breathing in normal air from our atmosphere, oxygen in its optimal amount at, a, at normal standard sea level conditions, 21% of 760 is about 161 millimeters of pressure. What we see in our lungs, in our alveoli, is that 161 millimeters of pressure becomes 100 millimeters of pressure. So on your best, on your most healthy, normal, average day, the best and highest amount of partial pressure of oxygen reaching your blood is 100 millimeters of pressure. Okay? This is why... Because some people don't have a lot of surface area. Some people don't have good perfusion, blood flow, and oxygen interaction in their lungs because they've got damaged lungs. They've got collapsed lungs. They've got issues. They've got diseases. This is why when you sit in your workspace, you might watch people and put them on supplemental oxygen. And what you're doing then is instead of taking in 21% oxygen from the atmosphere and nitrogen at 78% and all the other gases being 1%, you're going to manipulate that Dalton's component. You're going to manipulate the oxygen to maybe be 60% of the air breathed in by an individual, by the little tubes in their mouth. So you breathe in oxygen, more oxygen-rich air because the tubes uh, – poking in their nose or delivering more oxygen with every breath that the person is taking uh, into their, their system, right? And then if you put them on a mask, like we do with surgery and like we do with ventilators, you might be feeding that person either compressed air, which is going to be a little different con concoction of components, or you might be breathing 100% oxygen which is going to be a different concoction of components. It's going to be almost like 99% oxygen and maybe 1% other. And so Dalton's is going to come into play sometimes when we look at people. Are they adequately getting oxygen to their tissues? You know, that little meter where the blood is measured to see for its saturation level. All right? And you're going to manipulate potentially what air component or breathing gas mixture they get because of that, okay? And that's where Dalton's law is going to come into play. It's also going to come into play later on when we see altitude as our pressure drops. Well, all of the components, the partial pressures, the percentages stay the same, but what they pre pre then are contributing decreases, okay? Our last law is known as Henry's law. This is known as your soda pop law, and it is that the partial pressure of a gas. So that component of what contributes per gas to the solution is going to play a role in how much of that gas actually gets forced to change from gas to dissolved into a liquid. All right? And this is the soda pop law because when we look at our carbonation of our soda, we know that carbon dioxide in our atmosphere is less than 1% of the atmosphere. So if we carbonate our fluids, 
we, when we are making our soda, we put our soda water over a partial pressure of carbon dioxide that's greater than 1%. It might be 4%. And what happens is because the solution is in a fixed container with a higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide diffuses into that fluid until it's equal to enough is dissolved that equates to 4% or 4 millimeters of pressure. And we seal our sodas. And then when we pop our sodas, what happens is the atmosphere now sees less than 1% carbon dioxide. Our solution is at 4 millimeters of pressure of carbon dioxide dissolved in that fluid, and we start to see bubbles form. Okay? And you can do that with yourself. You can do that with yourself with nitrogen. You can do that potentially with yourself with oxygen as well. And carbon dioxide even. Okay? All right, so let's talk about breathing. Phase one of respiration is about moving air to the lungs and moving air to the alveoli. This part of respiration is heavy on Boyle's law, heavy on creating a pressure gradient by changing the volume that our lungs have available in the thoracic cage. We change the volume. We make the volume bigger in the lungs by actively contracting the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles and causing the, the volume of the lungs and the space of the thoracic cavity to enlarge. By causing that enlargement, the pressure in the lungs, the interalveolar pressure, the interpulmonary pressure is now going to be less than what it is outside the body in atmosphere, and we are going to force blood into or air into the lungs. Okay. Conversely, when we exhale, we relax the diaphragm. That's why it's passive. No muscles contract. Everything that contracted for inhale relaxes. The chest will collapse back into its smaller shape. The pressure in the chest will now increase because there's more air in those lungs from inhalation. And the pressure will now be higher than what it is in the atmosphere. And we will then see air move outside the lungs out to the atmosphere as long as there is a pressure gradient. So ventilation, movement of air into our body and out, is all about creating different pressures by messing with volumes of our lungs, by messing with the volume of our thoracic cage, and having the pleural cavity and the pleural membranes to tie the lungs and the chest wall movements to each other. Okay. A second part of getting the air to ventilate is that you have to have movement capability. You have to have lungs and connective tissues in the thoracic cavity, in the thoracic cage, in the pleural cavity, in the lungs that's capable of expansion. So it hasn't ossified, it hasn't lost its elastin proteins, and it has some what's known as compliance, some ability to expand and some ability to contract. Okay. And the greater the compliance of the lungs, the easier it is to expand and contract the lungs, so open and recoil the lungs, and therefore the easier it is to generate pressure gradients because it's easier to change the volume of the lungs that it occupies in the thoracic cage and therefore bring air in and out. Right? So compliance is going to be based upon a few things. First off, in the lungs, in the connective tissues in and around your bronchioles, your trachea, your alveoli, your pleural cavity, your thoracic cage, do you have connective tissues that have elastic proteins, that have connective tissues that can, under the influence of those proteins, give some and recoil some? Okay. So if you have connective tissue that is healthy, normal, and has elastin and collagen proteins and can give and expand and recoil and collapse, you will then have compliant lungs. So as we age, we lose some of our compliance. If we ever end up with a condition where we have connective tissue destruction, whether that's through exposure to chemicals, to toxins, to smoke, to pathogens, we will lose compliance. 
and we will lose connective tissue, and this, the lungs would be stiffer. They would be less likely to be able to expand and less likely to recoil. And then we would lose the ability to manipulate our volume, manipulate our pressure. Okay? So that's one of the ways we need to have compliant lungs. We need to have healthy connective tissue, elastin and collagen from our fibroblast and all of the connective tissues at all of the stages of the respiratory pathways, the lungs, the pleural cavities, even the thoracic cage. Okay, surfactant, remember that we humidify the air. Humidity means we add water to the air, and water is going to create pressure that wants to collapse the area around it. It wants to make surface tension that collapses and kind of like the reason why our um, tears kind of collapse into a little teardrop. That's what wants to happen with the lung water in the air. It wants to collapse the alveoli into these smaller little cavities, these smaller little spaces. So we have to overcome that. And the way we overcome that is we, with certain cells in our lungs, create a soapy, watery fluid that can prevent water molecules from wanting to collapse into these teardrops or smaller spaces. That fluid, that soapy mixture, is known as surfactant. All right. If we, for some reason, destroy all of our surfactant-making cells, that's going to be an issue and going to cause our lungs to collapse in. If at birth we are not fully yet capable of making surfactant, we could have infant respiratory distress syndrome. This is one of the reasons why preemies, in many cases, have to be given artificial surfactant, have to be kept in a NICU, because we want to make sure that they were born with the ability to make surfactant so therefore they can breathe on their own. And the age at which fetuses, embryos start to be able to make surfactant happens somewhere between the 24th week of development through about the 28th week of development. So when we look at babies born, 24 weeks is a critical time point because at that point it is possible that a baby can live. But every week beyond the 24 week, the odds increase because the odds of the fetus, the baby having cells capable of making surfactant increase. And so the prognosis is if you have a baby at 24 weeks, it's possible it can survive, might not. Every week after that, from 28 to 30 to 32, the odds get better and better and better. And it comes back to somewhat having surfactant available so the lungs don't collapse and the child isn't having to produce a really huge pressure gradient to force air into their lungs. Right? And the third reason why compliance will come into play is, again, having the ability for the ribs to expand and separate a little bit from each other, separate a little bit from the vertebral column, separate a little bit from the sternum. And in order for that to happen, you need to have some connective tissue. So you want to have that articular cartilage there. You want to have a little bit of um, freedom of movement. They're slightly movable joints. If they are not there, then you're not going to be able to move those ribs as easily. You're not going to be able to create a bigger volume. That means your pressure gradient will not be as robust and less air will move into the lungs. Right? And if we look at compliance of the lungs, and again, if you look at compliance when the lungs are fully collapsed or fully expanded, you're at those time points, you're at your least compliant. So when the lungs are fully collapsed, it's really hard to reinflate them. And when the lungs are fully inflated and open, it's really hard to get them to recoil down. So the middle part of compliance of the lungs is where we want to be. We want to be the lungs slightly open, slightly closed, so we have room to open a little bit more and close a little bit more, so that way we have ability to change volume. So we never want to overinflate the lungs, and we never want to completely underinflate or collapse the lungs, because then compliance is at its non-optimal point. Okay? All right. So with the lungs being forced open and changing the volume, and with compliance being able to give us the ability to open and change the volume of the lungs and therefore create pressures, we now have abilities to change pressures at different places in the body. So we're going to give these different places in the body different names. Intrapulmonary pressure normally refers to the pressure inside the lung. 
right? And we can be even more specific and talk about intraalveolar pressure, which is the pressure not only just inside the lungs, but inside each individual alveolar sac. And it's this pressure that we want to, when the volume of the lungs increases, we want to see decrease so that there's a difference between this intrapulmonary, intraalveolar pressure versus the atmosphere. Okay? Now remember, intrapleural pressure is the pressure between the parietal and the visceral pleura. And it's always below atmospheric pressure because the pleural membrane should be pulling away the visceral more with the thoracic cage, it wants to go out, and the visceral pleura wants to go with the lungs and collapse in. And so there's always this negative force of the membranes pulling away from each other, so that makes the pressure inside this cavity usually less than atmospheric pressure, less than 760. When you cause the thoracic wall with the diaphragm, with the, with the intercostal muscles to move further away from the visceral, this pressure should become more negative. And when you let the, um, parietal membrane relax with the muscles no longer contracting, it gets closer to the visceral membrane, it becomes less negative. So the difference that it moves away from atmospheric pressure is less. So normally we say it's about four millimeters of pressure less than what atmospheric is. So if atmospheric 760, it's about 756. When we inhale, and we make the distance between the visceral and the parietal membranes more distance, more pressure, it can get to somewhere around negative 8 millimeters of pressure. Okay? Atmospheric pressure is sometimes known as your barometric pressure. It's the pressure outside based upon where are you located in relationship to, you know, atmosphere, the, the sea level, where, you, where are you on altitude. Normally, atmospheric pressure, we want to be at zero feet sea level. We want to have standard humidity, standard temperatures. And if that standard condition is all met, one standard atmosphere, one atmospheric pressure is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury moving up a glass tube. That's the weight of the atmosphere as it presses on mercury in a bowl up a container. And that's what our little barometric pressure readings do. If you do anything in the English version, and all of our flying is in the English version, or the American version, I should say, everything's based upon inches. How much mercury will move? So if you ever watch the Weather Channel and they show you the barometric pressure, they're going to show you what's the barometric pressure in inches. Okay, and so when you maybe are in New Orleans and you're a few feet below sea level, your barometric pressure, and it's very humid and it's very hot, might be something like 30.1 inches, meaning the mercury, the weight of the atmosphere is more than a standard atmosphere. And when you go to, let's say, Colorado Springs and you're at almost, or Denver, and you're at a mile, you're at, you know, um, 7,000 feet above sea level, okay, a mile high, um, you would actually maybe see the pressure up there is at 28 inches or 27 inches of mercury, okay, because you're at less than one atmosphere, all right? When we fly, we actually take readings of what is the pressure outside the aircraft, and we use that to guesstimate then how high we are off the ground. Right? So when you're flying and they say, we're reading that we're flying at 30,000 feet, you might be reading that the pressure outside is equivalent to what we say 30,000 feet is for barometric pressure. You might actually be, if you're flying above Colorado Springs, 30,000 feet is only uh, maybe 23,000 feet above the ground because the ground is at 7,000 feet. Right? And so those pressure readings become important with flying and knowing how high you are in, in the air and then how high you are versus sea level, one atmosphere versus what you are above the ground, okay? All right, so let's look at a respiratory cycle, how the body takes one complete inhale, exhale. Again, when we inhale, we are going to contract muscles and move our thoracic cage to a larger volume, make it a larger space. When we move to a larger space, the volume increases, so the intraalveolar pressure, the intrapulmonary pressure, which is shown here, all right, and therefore shown on this graph, shows that the pressure actually decreased. 
And this little decrease in pressure is what's going to let us have the atmosphere pressure greater than the intrapulmonary pressure, and air is going to want to float into the lungs. Okay? When we inhale, again, we're pulling the diaphragm, we're pulling the rib cage out, we're pulling the parietal membrane further away from the visceral membrane. So the membranes in our pleural cavity get further away. So what happens is, as they move further away, the pressure in there actually gets more negative. It becomes more of a vacuum. Okay? And that's what's going to help us keep the lungs open, because the visceral membrane with that vacuum helps keep the lungs inflated. What we see for airflow is from the part where we are equal to atmosphere to where we have a pressure gradient, we are going to see air move into the lungs until there's no longer a pressure gradient because the volume of air inside the lungs brings the pressure back up to equal what it is outside the body. When we exhale, all right, everything is going to collapse. So we're actually going to see the distance between the visceral and the parietal membranes go back to their standard resting four degrees less than atmospheric conditions. We're going to see that that increased amount of volume of air in a smaller space is now higher pressure than what it is outside the atmosphere. And we're going to see flow of air out to the atmosphere until the pressures equalize. The volume that we move in a normal breath is going to typically be about 500 milliliters. And that normal volume of air that we move is known as our tidal volume, our movement of air in a normal inhale, exhale, normal breathing cycle. Okay? Again, our respiratory muscles are primarily the diaphragm and the external intercostals. We can use other muscles when we want to take more active, normal breaths, more increase and then more volume in. And those accessory muscles can be the internal intercostals, the sternocloidal mastoid, which is our prayer muscle, the serratus anterior, which are underneath our arms in our armpit area that help kind of open and separate the lungs, the pectoralis minor, which is going to help, again, move that clavicle and move the, um, the sternum and the, and the shoulder away from each other, make more space, and then the scalene towards the back. Okay? We can even add some accessory muscles when we want to start making our exhales more robust. And those are going to primarily be in the, um, in the chest, but also in the stomach, because what we're going to try to do is even push up on the diaphragm with these muscles and make the, the visceral organs in our abdominal pelvic cavity push into the thoracic cavity. So we're going to see there's a transverse thoracus, which is in the thorax, transverse abdominus, your belt that runs kind of like a belt across your belly, and then your six-pack muscle, your rectus abdominus, which is, again, all of those are helping squeeze on the chest itself, on the abdominal muscle, on the abdominal cavity, so it pushes into the thoracic cavity, making even less volume in the lungs, so more pressure generated, more airflow out of the lungs. And despite your best efforts, you should never fully get all the air out of your lungs. Right? When we do quiet breathing, that just involves the diaphragm and our external intercostals, our two primary muscles of inspiration, we are going to have um, quiet breath and tidal volume of approximately 500 milliliters. If we try to only breathe with one of those muscles, normally we can focus more on the diaphragm breathing, and usually that looks like deep breathing, but it's just more focused breathing where we become more aware and alert of the diaphragm and the contractions of it. When you're pregnant and you, your diaphragm can't really press into the um, abdominal pelvic cavity because the real estate's taken up by the, um, the womb, the uterus, and the baby, you're going to do more coastal breathing. And coastal breathing is going to look more shallow because we can't quite make as big of a volume change that we can with our diaphragm. Um, and so it looks more shallow breathing. But all both of those together work Normally, with every breath, the diaphragm and the, and the intercostals work together to form quiet breathing. The diaphragm is our more robust muscle to make more robust volume changes because there's more give in moving into the, the abdominal pelvic cavity than there is with the thoracic cage. There's limits to what the bone can do because it's slightly movable joints with the ribs and the sternum. Okay? When we start doing forced breathing, that's known as hypernea, um, that's going to involve 
again, like in this exercise, sometimes we focus on pushing the air out and breathing and then pulling the air in. You're going to uh, use um, your, your normal respiratory muscles, your quiet breathing muscles, and all your accessories. Okay, and in many cases, both phases, the inhalation and the exhalation, are active. You actively blow out, you actively pull in. All right? Now, some things to look at when we think about our breathing, our ventilation of the uh, lungs. How many breaths do we take in a given minute? For quiet breathing, we usually breathe anywhere from 12 to 18 times, and that is our respiratory rate. So that is the number of times the phrenic nerve charges the the um, diaphragm, because the medulla tells it to breathe, and it's about 12 to 18 times a minute. So about once every four heartbeats. So if you think back to the breathing and using the diaphragm and the thoracic cage pressure changes to help us with venous return, we're not using that every breath um, or every beat of the heart because we're not matching breath and heart rate at the same time. And even at our fastest Breathing rates, we still don't always match with our fastest heart rates because you can get up to almost 200 beats a minute, but you're not going to breathe at 200 breaths a minute, okay? All right. When we start looking at functionally the breathing rate, is it becoming sufficient to move air into the lungs, we want to look at some, some calculated values, all right? Our respiratory minute volume is a calculated value where we look at how many breaths are we taking a minute and how much air is moving into and out of the body per breath. So this is where we look at the tidal volume and our respiratory rate, and we multiply them, and in multiplying them together, we get about, every minute, how much air is being moved in and out of the system, okay? So every breath, we move about 500 milliliters of air. So if we multiply that we move 12 times 500 milliliters of air, in a minute, because we take 12 breaths a minute, we actually move about 6,000 milliliters of air per minute. And that, if you do the calculation of moving the decimal point to convert milliliters to liters, means we move about 6 liters of air a minute. Why do you care about this? Because when you look at gas uh, cylinders, they are measuring their contents not in pressure. They are measuring their contents in liters. So you need to know what to set your ventilators in liters so you know how much air is moving into and out of the ventilator per breath per minute so you know how long your tank's going to last because it only has a certain amount of volume of liters. And then you have to kind of convert, okay, knowing that my, my gas is compressed gas, normal air, or... 100% oxygen or some other concoction, you then have to manipulate your pressures and your partial pressures to make sure you're sufficiently giving enough air volume and enough air pressure to the person to sufficient and adequately perfuse their tissues. So that's why you have to know the leaders, okay? Now, when you exhale and inhale, some of the air stays at any given point in time in your respiratory conduction pathways. And that respiratory pathway is your residual volume of air and your anatomical dead space, your air space that you never have any perfusion, ventilation, movement of oxygen into and out of the bloodstream. And so you have to know that while you're moving six liters of air from the mouth every minute, what actually is getting to the capillary airway interaction in the deep parts of the lungs and the alveoli is a significantly less amount of air. And this gives us our calculation of our alveolar ventilation. So every minute, all right, every time you're moving air, there's some dead space, and therefore there's some residual volume of air that does not interact with the blood and is not then allowing for air to be exchanged with blood, right? And so when we calculate what then is the amount of air that's freshly getting received to the capillary air interchange is going to be our alveolar minute ventilation. And this is calculated as the frequency of breathing, so still you're taking about 12 to 16 breaths a minute. But the volume is now what is the minute vo or what is the 
tidal volume minus what is lost in dead air space, your residual volume. And if you do the calculation, on average for a healthy person, of their six liters of air they're breathing in and out every minute, only 4.2 liters is actually making it to the blood gas interchange. Okay, so this is one of those other reasons why when we look at the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, when you compensate that some of the air is not oxygen rich because it came from last cycle and it's carbon dioxide rich and then it's humidified, this is why the partial pressure of oxygen in our alveoli drops from 161 millimeters in the atmosphere to 100 millimeters of pressure in the alveoli. Okay. All right, and again, it's approximate because going back, this is assuming we have two healthy lungs, all right, with a tennis court worth of surface area. If you have a disease and you lose a portion of your lungs, Air is your, your residual air volume, your dead space increases. So this value will go down. There will be less of our six liters of air a minute actually getting to interact, maybe half of it. Only three liters is actually then being able to interact with blood and see oxygen in and carbon dioxide come out. Okay. All right. So when we look at people who are on oxygen, on ventilators, you know, in our nursing homes, we want to make sure that the oxygen getting to the tissues is sufficient. So how is it when we're hypoxic or when we're anoxic, how do we then manipulate and change to get more oxygen to the system, okay? Given that the atmosphere or the compressed air is not changing, okay? So what we can do is try to get more air to the alveoli by increasing the tidal volume. So we stay breathing 12 to 15 times, but we take bigger, deeper breaths. And by taking bigger, deeper breaths, we increase the tidal volume from 500 mils maybe to 600 mils, maybe to 700 mils. So we move a larger part of air into and out of the lungs with every breath. So that's one way someone who's hypoxic or having problems saturating oxygen at their tissues will try to get themselves to get more oxygen in their body. They can increase their tidal volume, take deeper breaths, keeping their breathing rate the same, right? Or flip it. One of the things we see with hypoxia is the breathing rate increases. So they try to take steady 500 milliliter breaths, so steady tidal volumes, but the respiratory rate will go from 12 to 18 to 22, 25 breaths a minute, okay? So when we look at people who are on respirators, that's what you're going to, in many cases, manipulate. You're going to manipulate, okay, I'm giving them compressed air. I'm going to give them compressed air that's going to be, instead of a normal tidal volume of 500, 600 milliliters a minute. If they're still not saturated, you know, I, I run that slippery slope of I don't want to overinflate and potentially damage the lungs by giving them too much tidal volume. So let me try to instead keep 600 milliliters and increase tidal volume. And now let me try to give more breaths per minute, make the respirator beat at a faster rate. Okay? And so that's what their, that respiratory therapist is looking at. Is the oxygenation in the thumb at the, you know, in the little machine, the, um, is it 98% saturated? Is it 95% saturated? And if it's not, can I increase the rate or can I increase the volume? Again, knowing that each of those is somewhat fixed. I can only increase so much the rate and I can only increase so much the volume. If I get to a point where I've maxed out, I'm at the highest rate I can possibly manage and the highest volume, now I might need to think about instead of giving this person compressed air, let me give them a more oxygen-rich solution. So let me maybe switch them to um, oxygen-rich air from 100% oxygen or some other oxygen-rich mixture, okay? All right, so putting it all together, again, the air we breathe under normal atmospheric conditions is normally made up of 78% oxygen or nitrogen, 
21% oxygen, and 1% all these other gases, of which carbon dioxide is usually less than 1% at about 0.4 to 0.3%. If we translate all of this into partial pressures per Dalton's law, again, your nitrogen that you breathe in is going to be 78% of 760, so it's like 500 and something, right? Oxygen is 160 millimeters of mercury. Your carbon dioxide, because it's less than 1%, it's like less than, you know, one millimeter of mercury. And the water, because again, we don't really have a high water content, is going to be zero millimeters of mercury. So the air we're breathing in is a good mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. Now, once we breathe the air in, we add a water component to the air. We humidify it. So right away, we are going to see that the total pressure is still 760, right? Oxygen is going to give up some of its piece of the pie of what it's contributing to the total pressure, so it's going to go from 160 to 150. Nitrogen is also going to give up some of its piece of the pie, so it's going to drop down as well. And in doing that, water, humidified air in our mouth, in our pharynx, and our larynx, is now going to take up about 47 millimeters of pressure. So it's going to be a bigger percentage, less more than 1%, all right? Carbon dioxide, we haven't mixed with the uh, dead air space yet, so it's still zero, okay? Once we get into the lungs and into the deeper portions with the bronchioles and the alveoli, we are going to start to see the dead air space mix in with the residual volume with our new fresh air from the outside environment. And because of that, we are going to see again, this mixing is going to change the partial pressures of our gases. Right? We're now going to add that carbon dioxide is up at 40 millimeters worth of pressure. Our water pressure stays the same. It doesn't increase or decrease, so it's still 47 millimeters of pressure. And our oxygen, in order to compensate for the changes with water and, and carbon dioxide, is now down to 100 millimeters of pressure. So that means in all of us sitting here as we're listening to this lecture, every time we're breathing in, we're breathing in 21% oxygen from our environment. By the time that air of 21% oxygen gets down to the lungs, it's not 21% anymore. It's a little bit less, right? And it is down for partial pressure of oxygen. It's partial pressure con contribution to 760 millimeters of total pressure is now 100 millimeters of pressure. And that is sufficient given that lungs have a certain amount of surface area. The blood is perfusing in to all this big, huge capillary network. The distance of the diffusion of the oxygen is very small. The oxygen partial pressure in the blood is very low, so we have a high gradient of oxygen in the air, low in the blood. We pull oxygen sufficiently into our bloodstream, so when it leaves, if you look down at this table, all right, with 100 millimeters of mercury in pressure of oxygen in the alveoli, all right, we now get a 98% saturation level, right? And on average, oxygen concentrations coming back from the systemic system, from the tissues, is down to about 40 millimeters of pressure. So we have a pressure gradient of about 60. And that is enough to drive oxygen sufficiently into the bloodstream to bind every single one of those um, hemoglobin binding sites. So 98% of those binding sites are attached to an oxygen, okay? And what isn't attached could be for that given split second, because molecules are constantly attached, break away, attach, break away. Some of them are broken away, but they're about to reattach. And then the rest of the oxygen is dissolved as a gas in the solution of your blood water, okay? All right. Going into Dalton's law, again, as we increase our altitude, our pressures decrease. As we decrease our total pressures, the oxygen content, the 21%, is going to decrease. All right? 21% stays the same, but if you take 21% of 523, you're down to 60 in the lungs. If you take 21% of 380, you're down to almost 40 in the lungs. Okay, so what happens is, as we go up in altitude, oxygen availability in the atmosphere is decreasing, okay? Now, we're going to try to pull more oxygen off of our hemoglobin 
so in our veins, we're going to see the oxygen coming back is less, and so we're going to keep our gradient a little bit to assist to pull oxygen in, but with that oxygen being less and less and less in the atmosphere, we're going to see that our gradient decreases and our ability to bind all of our hemoglobin oxygen binding sites is decreased. And those of you that work in the nursing home, you know, like for people, when they're on those oxygen readers, they, you don't want them below 90. When they're below 90, they start acting loopy because they're hypoxic. So if we look at it, most of us would be a little loopy, a little hypoxic. Our saturation would be less than 90, up at 10,000, 12,000 feet above sea level. So climbing Pikes Peak, climbing the 14,000 footers in Colorado is going to make us be a little hypoxic if we are used to living in sea level um, conditions. Okay? So imagine then going to base camp, base camps at what, 20,000 feet? We are going to be mildly hypoxic. And so we want to adapt. We want to robustly cause adaptions, make more red blood cells make our body more efficient at pulling off the oxygen from the red blood cells we have and making our uh, venous oxygen pressures even less. So that way we acclimatize a little bit and make ourselves better functioning at higher altitudes. Okay? All right? If we can't depend upon compressed air, we can manipulate this further. And this is what you saw in the movie. Instead of breathing air, we breathe oxygen. So all of our climbers, when they were getting up to 20, 22,000 feet, instead of breathing air, they were breathing oxygen canisters. And those oxygen canisters were making it to where the pressure they were breathing was, instead of 30 millimeters of oxygen at um, the lungs at 22,000 feet, it would be something like 321 minus 87. Why 87? Because that's what carbon dioxide and and water would typically take up. So let me do the calculator. 321 minus 87 should mean that about 230 something millimeters of pressure of oxygen is in the lungs, or it should be then getting to the lungs. Okay? And that should then be sufficient to help get back your blood saturation near normal levels. And that means your muscles then have oxygen to make ATP to help you take those steps up or take those steps down Everest in the mountain. Okay? And so I asked you to watch the movie or I read the book. I asked you to look at this table, look at the difference between what is in the atmosphere, what is in the alveoli, and then in the arteries. And there's a reason to that because having you fully understand then your person sitting in your hospital bed who potentially at sea level conditions has issues is very similar to what a normal person undergoes when they go to altitude. Okay? The difference is not that the altitude's changing, the difference is the lungs and the surface area available is changing. And so because those changes are at surface area level, we do the same manipulations. We give them more oxygen by not breathing air, just like we would do at altitude. We give them potentially more oxygen with pressure. So we pressure breathe. We give them um, maybe a mass that forces air with pressure into their system, giving, again, more pressure to get into the lungs. And so all of these things we do to treat our patients were derived in some of the ways by looking at what happens in healthy people when we go in altitude. Right? And so, again, patients who have lung disease shouldn't be traveling to Colorado and shouldn't be trying to hike Pikes Peak because they are already at a disadvantage at sea level. And that disadvantage in ability to get oxygen to their tissues is only going to get worse when the air they're breathing is less oxygen rich. Okay? All right, so when air enters the alveoli, it mixes with air from previous respiratory cycles. Because of this, the mixture has more carbon dioxide in the alveoli than the atmospheric air, right? And so anytime the residual volume increases, we're going to see the increase in carbon dioxide rich air. So our amount of air getting to the alveoli decreases and the oxygen content of that air would decrease. We will compensate with that 
by trying to increase, again, the tidal volume by grabbing some of that inspiratory reserve volume or expiratory reserve volume, right, taking deeper breaths. If that is still not sufficient, we can try to make the number of breaths increase. If that is still not sufficient, then we start making the air we breathe change from normal air to oxygen-rich air. So we put tubes in their nose. So the air coming in is now more oxygen-rich. Maybe it's 50% oxygen, 60% oxygen. If that is still not sufficient, we make it 100% oxygen. If that is still not sufficient, we now put them on a ventilator where it's oxygen pressurized pushing into their system. Okay? And we can then try to help them maintain oxygen sat. Right? So putting this all together, again, as we go up in altitude, pressure, total pressure decreases. The pressure of water and carbon dioxide does not change unless, again, you have more residual volume, more space, so then that would make this go up. Okay? All right. The remainder content of your total pressure is now subject to seeing oxygen in the air go down, oxygen tension in our alveoli go down, blood saturation going down. 90% is a critical line. That's where we start worrying about people being crazy, being hypoxic. So we always want to try to keep our hemoglobin saturated to at least 90% or better, because that's where we say we can somewhat make normal good decisions. Below 90%, we're going to see problems with decision making. We're going to see problems with our vision. We're going to see problems with our awareness. We're going to see problems with our muscles working at a high intensity, okay? That's where you're going to see potentially some of the adaptations come into play with making our body make more red blood cells. So the EPO will kick up. Making our body do a better job of grabbing some of the carbon dioxide, so making our venous carbon dioxide maybe go down. Making our respiratory rate go up to try to get more oxygen-rich air per minute to the alveoli. Making our tidal volume, our air amounts go up. Again, all those things trying to make it to where we can, at these higher altitudes, try to maintain blood saturation. But it's a losing battle unless we switch to pressure breathing and oxygen content-rich air. Again, Henry's Law is our Coke bottle solution. This is how we carbonate soda. And for the most part, not an issue for our bodies um, at normal sea level conditions. But we manipulate this a little bit with oxygen gas. So when we breathe that more oxygen-rich partial pressure gas, we are going to force more oxygen into not only binding to our hemoglobin, but into the solution itself. So people like me and you, normal people, when we go to those bars and we hook up and pay 20 bucks to sit with the tubes in our nose for oxygen-rich air, we're not really making our hemoglobin, which is already 98% saturated, carry more oxygen. We're actually helping put more oxygen in our plasma. And by putting it saturated in our plasma, dissolved in our plasma, we are potentially delivering more oxygen into our tissues. And that is potentially helping us not have be hungover and heal our wounds. All right, hyperbaric medicine does this, all right, hyperbaric, so high pressure medicine, putting people in a chamber and pushing air into the chamber and making more oxygen in the partial pressure of the air is going to make more oxygen go into the tissues, go into the solution of plasma delivered to the tissues, and yes, it will potentially promote wound healing. So this is a treatment option for people who have non-healing wounds, diabetic wounds, post-cancer treatments and radiation treatments where we may be damaged normal healthy tissue. Okay. Again, we do this at Coke bottles with carbon dioxide. Um, the problem is, again, too much oxygen under pressure, too much oxygen in our blood, water, in our cells can be toxic, so oxygen toxicity can happen. And again, this is like at 150 feet worth of pressure, so like four atmospheres worth of pressure. So diving really deep and living at depth could be a problem for long term. Um, people go crazy. 
Again, uh, and then it's a nitrogen issue when we talk about decompression sickness and again diving and flying where we make the nitrogen content change gradients very quickly. Okay. All right, so we're going to stop here for this lecture. So again, five reasons the lung gas exchanges um, where we'll start. So at this point, we've talked about why we want to ventilate, why we want to manipulate pressure and volume, Boyle's law, why we potentially want to manipulate Dalton's law, depending upon, again, where we are for ability for compliance of our lungs, for surface area of our lungs, you know, the, the condition of our lungs and the condition of our ability to perfuse air, blood interchange. And then, um, and then the changes that naturally occur in healthy people with going to altitude or diving, health, and then sick people with altitude diving and sea level conditions. Okay? So we're going to stop here. So I'm at this slide, and this is where I'll pick up next Wednesday and finish with our respiratory system. All right? If you have any questions, we'll talk about it on Thursday. Again, come ready on Thursday, having watched the Anatomy GMC video and ready to look at your models over your, um, your respiratory system. All right.